This video was created as background material for my upcoming RV Dimmer shootout video. This video is limited to the technology that you may find in 12 volt dimmers typically used in boats and RVs. In this video you will learn what an LED is, the need to control the LED, what a LED driver is, and different types of LED drivers. Are all LEDs dimmable? what pulse width modulation is, PWM characteristics, and importance of PWM frequency. Dimming different types of LEDs, mixing different types of LEDs in the same dimmer, dimmer efficiencies, and high side and low side dimmers. Dimmer overheating issues, and finally dimmer ampacity. Now there's a lot of information in here, and if you don't understand it all, I encourage you to watch this video a couple times. A LED is a light emitting diode and it is similar to any other diode in that it allows current to flow in one direction and when that current flows it emits light. However we must have a method to regulate how much current flows through the LED otherwise too much current will flow and the LED will quickly burn itself out. And the simplest method of doing this especially if the diodes are under one watt is to use a series limiting resistor and in this LED strip we can see here there are three RGB LEDs and there's also a current limiting resistor for each color. That is sufficient for these low power diodes. Unfortunately this solution becomes impractical when we start looking at LED fixtures that are three, four, or five watts. Then we need such a high wattage resistor that we end up using something like this and this wastes a tremendous amount of power. So then the next solution is to use what is known as an LED driver. So you may be asking why do I need to know about LED drivers? And the answer is each type of LED driver may behave differently depending on the type of dimmer you have. Now you may have heard people say well not all LEDs are dimmable. Well that's not totally true. It's more of a compatibility issue between the LED dimmer and the LED fixture. Here are two nearly identical LED fixtures. The first one is a Facon DLF ST4-008. The next one is a Facon LF ST4-012. And from the manufacturer's website, the D stands for dimmable. So let's take and unscrew the covers. And when we look under the bezel, we see two different types of LED fixtures. The one on the left has several components, including this large semiconductor. This is what limits the current. And there's a few components in here that actually sets this up so that it can only supply so much current. So this would be a linear driver. And for this one, we see only LEDs, no driver components. But when we further disassemble this LED fixture, we see a little more of a sophisticated circuit board and I see a capacitor in here and I see two coils here. This tells me that this is a switch mode driver. So to recap, you may run across one of three different types of drivers. The simplest driver is simply a current limiting resistor. This is voltage dependent, so if we have any change in voltage, we will have a change in current. For this reason, and because large wattage resistors waste energy, this method is only used in very low powered LEDs such as LED strips. With a linear driver we have simply a current regulator and we ensure the LED only receives the amount of current that it requires for full brightness. With a switch mode driver things get a little more complicated. There are two stages to the switch mode driver. There's a internal PWM or pulse width modulator and also an internal filter. The pulse width modulator generates a fairly high frequency square wave and the PWM output is filtered out by a coil and capacitor combination and that results in a constant current to the LED. The surefire way to tell if you have a switch mode driver or not is the presence of one or more coils and capacitors. In every case, the way these dimmers will dim the LED is by a technique called pulse width modulation or PWM. A pulse is simply a transition from 0 volts to 12 volts and back. 
The simplest example would be turning the switch on and off. It would generate a single pulse as shown here. And if we turn that switch on and off repetitively, we'll have a series of pulses, which is called a square wave. And one important characteristic of a square wave is its frequency, or the number of times it repeats itself. For example, a 100 hertz square wave would repeat itself 100 times a second. Another important characteristic is the pulse width. The pulse width is the on duration of each individual cycle within the square wave. The duty cycle is a ratio of the on time of the pulse width versus the off time. Here we see that the on time and off time are 50%, so we have a 50% duty cycle. In this example, the duty cycle has changed so that the on time is only 25% of each cycle. That gives us a 25% duty cycle. In a similar fashion, if we have a 75% on time, we have a 75% duty cycle. When we change the duty cycle of the pulse, we are modulating the pulse width. And that's where the term pulse width modulation comes from. In this first test, I simply have 12 volts coming from a power supply and I'm connecting a on-off switch, momentary switch, to the positive side and going to the oscilloscope probe. So all I'm going to do is just turn the switch on and off. And while we do that, we're going to monitor the oscilloscope. An oscilloscope is just simply a method of looking at voltage versus time. And when the line is vertically in the center of the screen, that represents zero volts. And now I'm going to depress the switch and keep it held down. The line will jump up, which represents 12 volts. Now, if I repeatedly press that switch and release it, I'm sending a series of pulses to the oscilloscope. If we hold the switch on longer than we let it go, you'll see that it's on most of the time and off only a short period of time. That represents a duty cycle of about 90%. If I depress and release the switch quickly and then pause a little bit, we'll get just the opposite. And that would be closer to a 10% duty cycle. Perhaps the most significant thing to understand about PWM dimming is that the brightness of the LED corresponds to the duty cycle. So really we're not dimming at all, we're just varying how long the LED is on versus how long the LED is off per cycle. Since this occurs at a high rate of speed, just like watching a movie, your eye cannot see each individual frame, but rather it averages what it sees into a perceived brightness. And so now we've replaced the on-off switch with a dimmer and the light. And again, when we watch our oscilloscope, and I'm shining the light in so that you can see it dim and undim. So here we're mostly off, here we're mostly on. That in a nutshell is how PWM works. The series current limiting resistor setup is the easiest to dim, so we'll start there. Simply place a PWM dimmer on the input of the resistor, and the LED's brightness will be in accordance with the setting of the dimmer. And when we turn the LED dimmer on, we're full dimmed. Now we're full brightness, and back to dim. And we can verify that by looking at the PWM signal on the oscilloscope. Here we're full dim with almost 0% duty cycle. And as we increase to the full brightness, we're almost at 100% duty cycle. And I should point out that virtually any PWM 12 volt dimmer designed for LEDs will work with a LED strip. And in a similar fashion to the LED strip, when we want to dim a constant current linear driver, we simply put a PWM dimmer on the input. The PWM signal will dim the LED. So now we'll try the same thing with a linear driver. And I'm going to turn this fixture over so it doesn't blind us. And I'm going to turn it on. As you can see, we have full brightness, and then we have full dimming. And if I bring this about the middle, we're looking at close to 150 hertz. Which is the frequency of the PWM dimmer that we're using. And as you may suspect, the switch mode driver takes some special care, and not all dimmers will dim a switch mode driver. 
When the frequency of the PWM signal supplied by the dimmer is much lower than the switch mode driver's internal PWM frequency, dimming is possible. But when the dimmer's PWM frequency is nearly the same as the switch mode driver's internal frequency, dimming does not occur. And now we're going to conduct the same test using the LED fixture with the switch mode driver. And again, I'm going to turn this over. And you can see we have full brightness, we have dimming, and again we're at 150 hertz. So with this low frequency dimmer, we can dim this switch mode LED fixture. And now we've replaced the low frequency dimmer with a dimmer that has a higher frequency. And let's turn the power on. And as we rotate the knob, you can see we have no dimming at all. Until we get to the point where the pulse width is so wide that the LED cannot stay illuminated. Our frequency is 12 kilohertz. This is a much, much higher frequency dimmer. Consequently, it's interfering with the internal PWM mechanism in the LED itself. So let's say you have six puck lights in the ceiling of your RV and are connected to a dimmer like this. And let's say all the LED fixtures have linear mode drivers like this. And one of the LED fixtures have failed. So you go to the RV store and you and the salesman look and say, Hey man, this one looks pretty close. I'll try this. And you bring it home, and unbeknownst to you, it's a switch mode LED fixture, and you connect it together with your other LEDs. And you turn your lights on, everything's okay. Now it comes time to dim them. You're saying, What the heck? This thing is dim, and this one isn't. So, what's wrong? Well, you'd be correct if you said, Well, I picked up a switch mode LED fixture and the frequency of the dimmer is such that it's not dimming. So let's say you have a low frequency dimmer and the same situation exists. You have an LED fixture with a linear driver and you added a switch mode fixture. And we turn the lights on, okay. Now we start to dim and yes they both dim but look at this they're not dimming at the same rate. This one is much dimmer than this one. Yeah, I know it's hard to tell in the video, but they are definitely different. And we really have not covered this issue yet, but there are different efficiencies in the different type drivers. So they do dim at different rates. And the point is, you should always replace the LED fixture with an identical one if you're dimming them. And there are two different types of dimmer wiring schemes, high side and low side. A high side dimmer is wired such that the dimmer itself is higher or closer to 12 volts than what the LED is. And with a low side dimmer, the dimmer is lower than the LED is in respect to 12 volts. Now when you look for a dimmer, you'll find either a high side or a low side dimmer. So you'll have to choose which one is applicable in your situation. If your LED is tied to ground, as shown here, Let's say it's a chassis ground in an automotive situation. Let's look at what happens when you try to use a low side dimmer. If you attempt to connect the LED to the dimmer, you will see there's no way that either the LED or the dimmer can be powered. And if you try to connect the LED to 12 volts, then it's going to be full brightness all the time and the dimmer is not even going to be in the circuit. And the same situation exists if the negative side of the LED is inaccessible. For example, let's say the LED's negative side goes back to the DC distribution panel from a different route. So if the LED is grounded or the negative side is inaccessible, the only option is to use a high side dimmer because the high side dimmer goes between 12 volts and the LED. If both positive and negative leads are available for your LED, you can use actually either a high side or a low side dimmer, it doesn't matter. If your LED is grounded or an accessible negative, you must use a high side dimmer. However, high side dimmers are sometimes more expensive, which is why you do see some low side dimmers on the market. If you recall, we originally talked about generating the square wave by turning a switch on and off, and that's characterized here. And in a perfect world, we're going to have a perfect looking square wave. And the thing we want to look at mostly is how straight these transitions are and how straight the flats are. 
and the square wave represents the voltage that we see right here and further we have one amp of current flowing through the LED we see that we have zero volts across the dimmer and even though we have one amp of current flowing through the dimmer there's no voltage drop so there's zero watts across the dimmer the LED since it has 12 volts across it and it has the same one amp because this is a series circuit we have 12 watts however we don't live in a perfect world now this is a screenshot for a real PWM dimmer and in this example the dimmer is driving an LED strip that has a series resistor for the current limiting device and as we can see it's a pretty good looking square wave so in this example the dimmer is not going to consume any power at all but there's trouble ahead in this example, we replace the LED strip with a puck light having a linear mode driver. And look what happens. You can see that we no longer have a straight transition. We have a curve going all the way from about 8 volts to 0 volts. And that's bad news. Unlike a current limiting resistor, a linear driver as well as a switch mode driver are active components. They have transistors, they have coils, they have capacitors, whatever. And here's the switch mode driver. Look how bad this is. This here is zero volts. So this thing never even attempts to get below maybe nine volts. So it goes from 12 volts to nine volts, 12 volts to nine volts. And again, this is a real dimmer. In this linear driver, when we have such a waveform, the dimmer is going to be absorbing some of the energy. Now we cannot easily come up with an average by a simple method like this, but we're just gonna look at an instantaneous point in time so let's look at here, let's say we have three volts here, the dimmer is gonna dissipate some power and that's not good. So to kind of modify the graph a little bit, this is the energy that's going to be supplied to the LED. And since this represents an area where the dimmer is not turned off, then it's going to be dissipating some energy. So you see the same LED dimmer when connected to either the LED strip, a linear driver or the switch mode driver, is going to have a different output. So we have to keep that in mind when we select the dimmer. And the better dimmers, such as this one, this actually has a heat sink on the back to help dissipate some of that energy if we hook it up to a driver. Other dimmers, however, such as this one, I really wonder how much heat that this can dissipate. Now I can't tear it apart because it's all encapsulated, but there's no room to put a heat sink in here. And regardless of the dimmer that you use, I would recommend keeping an eye on how much heat these generate, especially if you're using these with puck lights. Now this one I would have no problem in using it with an LED strip light, but I'd be a little wary about using it with a puck light, at least without really monitoring it for a while and making sure that it doesn't overheat. And the last topic of importance is how these are wired. And you'll see the wiring here is fairly good size and if I use my Digikey Electronics ruler this looks to be about 16 AWG and to look at this one it's about 22 AWG and most of the dimmers do have a maximum current that they specify they can't handle but you want to go online and get an ampacity chart and look for yourself by looking up the gauge of the wire and what the recommended maximum ampacity is in contrast to what they're telling you because I've found that sometimes they're a little bit liberal with their ratings. Well hopefully now you have a pretty good understanding of how dimmers work in the DC environment and you will have enough information that you can select the dimmer properly in your project.